Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Chase Plastics Chase the Knowledge webinar on material selection fundamentals. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. My name is Sherry Cudd. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for Chase Plastics. Uh, we thank you all for your interest in this webinar and for taking time out of your busy day to attend. A few quick housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone except the presenter is on mute and will be for the duration of the webinar. But if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so at any time by typing it um, in the question section. Um, if you'd rather ask your question verbally, please raise your hand in the toolbar and I will unmute you and call on you to ask your question out loud. If your question does not get answered right away, we will address it at the end of the webinar. You can access and download PDF copies of this presentation um, as well as our product line card and some additional information in the handout section of the um, toolbar. You can download those anytime during the presentation. If you are attending live today, a certificate of completion and a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you um, about an hour after the webinar concludes. You will receive a separate email from Andrea with a PDF of the presentation and handouts. We would greatly appreciate it if you could complete the survey at the end so that we can improve future webinars for you and cover the topics that you care about most. We encourage you to check out past webinars and recordings on the webinars page of our website at chaseplastics.com backslash webinars. If you would like a custom Chase Knowledge presentation given to your organization discussing a specific topic or material, please send an email to your presenter, Andrea Kendrick or myself. Our entire sales and technical team are always ready to assist with technical issues, material selection, and educating you and your team on products and processes specific to your needs. Our next webinar on outdoor plastics is scheduled for August 27th and is now live on this page to register. I have put a registration link in the chat box for your convenience. So you just, if you know already you're interested in attending that, you can just click on the link in the chat box and it will take you there to register. Future Chase and Knowledge webinar announcements will also appear on our webinars page of our website. You can also now subscribe or invite coworkers to subscribe to receive all notifications of future Chase to Knowledge webinars. And that can be found by just clicking that button that says subscribe here for webinar notifications. Another great technical resource uh, is the Chase to Knowledge blogs on our website. Those can be found at chaseplastics.com backslash blogs or under the resources tab from the home page. And a quick side note, we just want to thank everyone who stopped by our NPE booth to say hi and play some Plinko. It was a great show and we're already planning for NPE 2027. In addition to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick, who I will introduce in a moment, we also have Jason Merkel, technical manager, on hand today to answer your questions. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to our presenter, Andrea Kendrick. Andrea is a technical training engineer with Chase Plastics and has been with us since 2015. She received her bachelor's degree in plastics engineering technology, from Ferris State University. For those of you who have attended Chase to Knowledge webinars in the past or contacted our technical engineering team for assistance, you're very familiar with Andrea and the level of expertise that she brings to the table. So without further ado, Andrea. Good afternoon, everybody. So today we're gonna to talk about material selection fundamentals. Uh, gave a similar presentation back in 2020, but this is a little more updated version, if you will, a little more data, a little bit more information. So today we're going to go over the importance of material selection. We're going to go kind of through the process of selecting a material. We're going to talk about some key material properties and performance, as well as ease of manufacturing. A lot of this is going to be centered around, you know, 
why we ask certain questions and certain questions and things to consider when you come to us or you're working on a material selection and you say, hey, you know, what should I make this out of? These are a lot of the things that you hopefully are considering when you're looking through that and trying to figure out what material you're going to be using. Okay, so the importance of it specifically, so Chase plastic, plastics alone represents over 35,000 grades of materials. Those are just the ones that you know we've we've used or, or entered recently. There are so many more that are available, and this again just Chase plastics. So, and what grade or material is going to be best when there's so many options available. So the only way to do that is make sure we're asking the right questions and understanding the requirements of the application so we can start to narrow it down. And so in the handout section or the materials section within this webinar, there's our line card, which is what this little picture is, as well as a link to go to our website to look at it from there as well. And then the other thing to note is that with sustainability becoming such a large topic, we have all of these material options, all of these great options, and then we also potentially have a sustainable version of that material. So 35,000, and then maybe if we had one for every single one in a sustainable version as well, another 35,000. So lots of materials available. And then this is just our line card that goes over some of the options that we have to support sustainable requirements. Yep. So now when we talk about different materials, we talk about all the different grades, just to give a, a quick little show, a little bit of data, if you will, even within specifying different families of materials. So your amorphous materials, which are gonna give you your better dimensional stability um, and performance and less shrinkage, a little bit easier maybe to process. But if you look at an ABS versus a PSU, so cell phone versus an ABS, big differences in performance. So within the same family, big differences. Same if you look at some in crystalline, you have your PBT, nice engineering material, versus peak, your specialty type material. Again, huge difference in performance, and those are just within the same family. So now imagine that we're talking across families, engineering versus commodity versus specialty, so many options, so many different performances, and then additional requirements that might be needed. And so we really have to dive into what we're looking for to make sure that we're making the right suggestion. Okay. So the process of going through and selecting a material these are the kind of the five steps that, that I like to go through or follow that really help me determine what material I'm going to suggest or materials if there's a few options that could meet what we're looking for. The first one's gonna be, we're gonna to need to define the requirements. What's required out of this part, this application? Next, we're gonna to wanna to weigh the requirements in terms of wants versus needs. We'd always want a low price, right? But is it a need? Is it going to be cost prohibitive? stuff like that. So we'll go through maybe some weighing of those wants versus needs. Then we're going to talk about the environment. So I can find a perfect material on the data sheet at room temperature that performs great, but maybe when I put it outside, it's not going to perform the same. So I need to be aware of that and make sure I'm accounting for that when I'm making a suggestion for a material. Then we're going to talk about some key material properties and or approvals that I might need on that material again, might find you the perfect material, and then you come back and say, well, it needs to be a medical material. Well, if there's been no medical testing because it's not marketed for that segment, well, now I might not be able to suggest that material for you, okay? And then lastly would be understanding part design and then ease of manufacturing. So how am I gonna manufacture it? Where is it going to be manufactured? Stuff like that also will play a role in what we suggest or what type of material that can be used. Okay, so defining the requirements of the application. We want to and must understand our critical to quality requirements, CTQ, if you've not heard that acronym before, Quit critical to quality. So what is an absolute must for this material to perform, for the part to perform the way that it needs to? So some of the questions we might ask would be, is this a new or an existing tool? If you already have a tool, either on your shop floor or maybe you're an end user and it's getting sent to a molder that needs to do it. If there's already an existing tool, now we're limited on stuff like shrinkage for the material. I need to match that. And so now I've already narrowed down a whole section of materials that I can or cannot use based on that. Where and how it's gonna be manufactured. So where, if I'm manufacturing it in Mexico, where maybe it's a little more humid than up here in Michigan, right? So that might affect what I can use or how I would use it. 
and if they have the equipment to handle processing it. Where is the part going to be sold? So if I sell it in California, do I need a Prop 65? Is it being sold to Europe and it needs to meet certain European requirements? I need to be aware of that. Is there any importance on the aesthetics of the part? Do we care what it looks like? Do we care what color it is? Do we care about the texture? All of those things that could be important. What type of regulatory approvals are needed? Does it need medical? Does it need UL? Does it need NSF? So we'll talk about that a little bit in, in further slides. What environment is it going to be exposed to? Is it going to see heat? Is it going to see UV? What is it going to see that is going to affect its performance? Now I need to make sure I get a material that is going to withstand those and perform well at those temperatures or exposures. And then also what type of load, wear, or impact is this part going to see? So it might check every other box, but maybe it's a tray and I'm going to drop it. Well, I need to make sure that it's going to have the impact to withstand something like that. Or it checks all the other boxes, but I'm making a gear and it's going to wear on itself. Well, maybe I'm not using a certain material because it doesn't wear on itself well. So I need to know these things. We need to know to ask these questions so we can suggest the right material. So some of what that might look like would be your location of manufacturing. So a target end moisture. So some of our materials that pick up moisture and we have to drive it really low. If you're in a really humid environment or maybe your location or warehouse where they're going to make it has really high humidity. If you don't have the proper equipment to dry it, well, now we're going to potentially have a problem running that material in that location. So that could be a problem. And then your existing tool would be, do I have to match shrinkage or not? So in the shrinkage column of the common processing guide, you can see huge variance. Your amorphous material is shrinking a lot less, generally your three to seven thou range versus your semi-crystalline materials, they're going to shrink a lot more. So something to be considered if a tool already exists. Okay. So now we need to weigh our requirements. So as an example, I put something together, we uh, a makeshift one, if you will. So starting with what the requirements are. And so hopefully this is something that you guys are aware of, or you start making a list of what is needed. And then you come to myself or a tech or your seller and say, hey, these are what I need out of the material. And then we can start to figure out if it's a want or a must uh, uh, have. And so starting with, I need a soft material, 60 Shore A. I need it to bond to polyamide, nylon. I need to be able to color it pink, green, and blue, available in bags, FDA compliant, does not need to be dried. So maybe this is a grip on a toothbrush, could be an example of what this, this is kind of mimicked after. So my must haves in this case is I need it to be FDA. You're gonna put it in your mouth or near around it to brush your teeth. Uh, and you want it to be able to touch uh, food, be around me in my mouth, whatever. I need it to chemically bond to the polyamide nylon. Maybe it's nylon bristles on your toothbrush. So I need to make sure that it's going to bond to that. It kind of doesn't work for what it's supposed to if it doesn't do that. I need it to be soft in a 60 Shore A. Maybe I have some leeway and maybe I can go a little softer, a little harder, but that's overall what I need it to be. And then I do need to be able to color it because that's how I'm gonna sell the product. I need to be able to make it pink, blue, green, maybe some other colors. Some wants though, and not an absolute must have or need would be available in bags. I can make it work maybe if it's a, a box, I can figure that out make it work and does not need to be dried. It would be ideal if I didn't need it to be, but if I have to, I can. And these would all be based on the customer's ability to do it. Uh, and then as well as what the, what we can meet in terms of our material. So weighted them out, wants, must haves. Okay, and then a similar type of, of uh, example would be if I come and I say, I need something to be clear. I need it to be V0 flame rated at three millimeter. I need high flow service temperature of above 100 degrees C made domestically and a notched IZOD greater than two foot pounds per inch. So my must haves in this application is that it needs to be V0. It's going into some type of UL type of application where it needs to be flame rated. It's going to be in an environment that sees 100 degrees C. So it's obvious that it must withstand that because if you put it in that environment and it doesn't withstand that, it's kind of not useful to anybody. So must withstand the temperature does need to have the impact above two. Potentially it's something that's gonna get hit where I drop and it needs to have good impact. And then the wants would be clear. Maybe I can make it work if it's opaque. Maybe in a different scenario, clear is a must have. Maybe 
it's because it's a lens or going over some type of meter and I need to be able to see behind it. But in this particular example, it is just a want, it's not a need. And then high flow and made domestically being wants. Made domestically could potentially become a must have if we're doing work with the military um, or any type of federal spec we need to meet. Potentially made domestically is a requirement and not just something I want it to be. And so we always look at each application and all the requirements and we figure out what we need and what we want. And then we figure out from there what's going to be our best option for material in those situations. Okay. So then after we do that or even before, what have you, but still needs to be considered, we need to think about what type of environment the part is going to be in. And so what is it going to be exposed to? And so the majority of those are going to be, is it going to see certain temperatures? Is it going to be exposed to certain chemicals? Is it going to see UV? Is it outside? Is it going to see certain stresses? And does it need any type of wear and friction performance? And so we'll talk about each one of those kind of briefly in terms of how it affects the different materials. So environment, temperature exposure. So what type of temperature is the part going to be exposed to? Not only that, how long is it going to be exposed to that temperature? Because if it just peaks at a certain temperature, not as detrimental to the part or performance than if it is meant to withstand that temperature for hours on end, continuously exposed to that temperature. And then what is my expected performance at that temperature? Does it need to perform like it would at room temperature at the temperature you provided? Or does it need to maintain half of its performance, 70% of its performance? These are all things that we would have to know or at least attempt to figure out to make sure that we're suggesting the right material. In a lot of these cases, we're gonna try to suggest a material that meets it without overdoing it. We don't wanna over-engineer a material because you're gonna end up paying for that. Your over-engineered materials are typically more expensive. So if we, we wanna try to meet something, it's gonna be exactly what you need without overdoing it. Okay, and then some data here to show some long-term heat aging. It just shows that it takes less stress and less time for the material to break once you get to higher temperatures. So you can see at 390F, it breaks pretty quickly. Uh, and then compared to 300 or 270 even. So long-term heat aging. So if I see it for a long period of time, what happens? It breaks sooner if it's seeing a higher temperature. And then some more data on temperature would be showing your modulus or your stiffness compared to the temperature. So this shows loss of your modulus at different temperatures as well, and showing semi-crystalline versus amorphous that have two separate thermal points. So your semi-crystalline material will start losing some of its stiffness at its TG, the glass transition temperature. You'll get some molecular movement in the amorphous sections of your semi-crystalline material. So it'll drop some of its performance, drop some of its stiffness, and then it will lose the last of it at the TM, which is your melting temperature when the crystals start to break apart finally, and it loses all of its performance. And then you compare that to amorphous materials that don't have crystal regions, they only have a glass transition temperature. And so fairly holding its stiffness fairly decently until you hit your TG and you lose all of its performance. So if you were to look between about 150-ish range F to the 200 degrees, your amorphous, and this is PEI in this case, PEI is actually outperforming your PVT. And so what stiffness do I need at what temperature I'm picking? What performance does it need a certain impact at that? What is it doing at that temperature that I make sure I find a material that can withstand that? Okay, another type of exposure, chemical resistance. So it's seeing temperature, maybe not, but maybe this application is seeing chemical. Is it something in a hospital where it's gonna get wiped down with certain wipes that could cause problems? Is it something where it needs to hold a certain chemical? Does it come in contact with coolant? Does it come in contact with gas? Because it could perform, like I said, great in every other aspect, but as soon as it's exposed now to a chemical, it could cause problems, it could crack, it could swell, and now it's not gonna perform the way that you want it to. So some of the things when you think about what chemical or chemicals it's going to be exposed to, how long it's gonna be exposed to that. Is it potential that you get a little bit of splash on your part and you wipe it off and it's not as big of a deal? Or is it going to sit in some of that oil or that gas or that coolant for an extended period of time? 
And then also what temperature is it going to be exposed to? So it could be that the material will withstand the chemical no problem until you increase the temperature, which then goes to the environment will see chemical and temperature and it can start to degrade it sooner. And so a couple of examples of that uh, on the page, you can see where a lot of it will have excellent or good uh, performance. And then as soon as you get to the 50 degrees C, you start to lose some of that performance, some of its resistance to that chemical. And most of this is gonna be chemical specifically, is gonna be primarily based on the actual base material. You can do some things, maybe copolymerize a little bit with certain things, um, add some glass, and then you're displacing some of the material with glass instead. That gives you a little bit better of chemical resistance, but really it's primarily based on the base itself. So whatever the base material will withstand is what the overall material and part made of that material will withstand. Okay, and then a little bit more information on your chemical resistance. Ideally, if you are looking to show a comparison between a couple materials, and their resistance to certain chemicals or a chemical, you're going to want to use a guide that is it has both materials listed because then we know for sure that the temperature is going to be the same, the time is the same, the amount is the same. So all of the conditions at which it is exposed to that chemical will be the same between the two materials. So it's an apples to apples comparison of, let's say, a PC compared to an ABS when we do chemical resistance if it's from the same guide. Okay. And then the other thing to note is that your amorphous materials are more sensitive to chemicals and more prone to stress cracking, which you can kind of see in those pictures where it's starting to crack when it's being bent a little bit. So your amorphous materials tend to be a little more susceptible to chemical attack. And so that's why, depending on what chemical and what we're doing, what temperature, we're more likely to look at some crystalline materials. But it all really comes down to what chemical, how long it's exposed, and what we're doing with it. And then lastly, the note would be your in-application testing is always going to be the best way to show the performance of that material and or part made of that material in uh, for its performance with chemicals. So take your part, expose it to how it will be exposed in application to do the testing. It's always the best way to do it. So another type of exposure is going to be your UV exposure. So temperature is one thing, chemical is one thing. Now UV exposure is another. Now, in some cases, your part will not go outside. So then we don't need to worry about any of this. But if you have the potential for the part to go outside, get UV exposure, what have you, we need to consider that now. So is it going to be exposed to UV? Even if it's filtered light coming through a window, in a car, in a house, it's still going to get some UV exposure to be filtered so it will not be as strong as if it was just sitting outside but it's still getting exposed to that. So that might be something we need to consider. So will it be exposed to UV? How long will it be exposed to UV? How often? Is it a part on your car on the roof that is up and exposed to the sun anytime the sun is out? Or is it a part maybe inside the car where even the filtered light has a hard time getting to it? We'd wanna know what type of performance we're expected to see there. The other thing to keep in mind is then, how are we going to determine what's acceptable after exposure? So the main ones would be your property retention. So exposed to UV, does my impact suffer? Does it start to become brittle and my impact suffer? Or do I maintain my performance? And then the other side of that is going to be a color shift. Is it acceptable? Is it not? In the case where the picture you see stadium seating, probably not looking too great. And so you're going to have quite the opinion on the way that that looks. And so that could be an issue. But we will want to understand what is the end goal here? Do I want to make sure there's not a color shift? And so it doesn't haze up if it's clear, turn yellow, change color, or do I just care if it maintains its performance, whether it looks good or not, does it still continue to perform? And so those are the questions we're going to want to understand. So that way we can also find data that matches what you're expecting out of it. And then just a little table that gives a general idea of how some of the materials perform. A lot of this to say aromatic TPUs, so standard TPUs, and ABSs, HIPs, PC ABSs, not so great with UV exposure. And so if you come to us and say, hey, I want to put, you know, this ABS part outside for the, the duration of its uh, life cycle, not great. We're not really going to recommend that. And so on the flip side, if you had something like an acrylic or an ASA, 
would be okay to be outside. And again, it all comes down to what you expect it to do and or look at, look like, excuse me, after the exposure and for how long it will be exposed. All right, so in addition to temperatures, chemicals, UV, some of the other stuff that needs to be considered is any type of stress that might be on the part, whether it be needing the material to have a certain level of stiffness. And so if I'm leaning back in my office chair, what type of stiffness is that and what is it providing? What type of impact might be needed? Certain parts on the chair, if you kind of sit down a little quickly, maybe it needs to withstand some of that. Is there any type of uh, load that it needs to withstand? So a stress, a load, being compression or tensile stress, what have you, any type of stress that might be on the part. And then lastly, are we worried about if the part needs to be flexed or bent or assembled? And so I need to do, and then in addition to that, does it need to continuously do that? So if I'm assembling it, do I take it apart and then put it back in? Maybe it's a clip and it needs to do that a bunch of times. And so I need to make sure I know that so I can get a material that's gonna withstand or wear well enough to allow that to happen uh, when it's in application. And then some additional data on that, something for creep modulus. So if there's a constant load, how much is it deforming? And so if it's a load in you know, tension or compression or what have you, if I'm putting a load on this part, is it going to start to deform and cause issues maybe with the performance? This particular graph shows two different materials, a nylon six and a polypropylene, both 30 glass. You can see that at room temperature under a 30 MPA load at about we'll call it maybe 40 hours, that your nylon is going to start outperforming the propylene. And so you're going to start to see more deformation in the propylene part than you will in the nylon part under those loads. So things to consider. So it might, again, initially work great, but after time, if it's under a certain load, it's going to deform. And then potentially you have issues with the performance of the part itself because it's starting to deform. So something we also need to keep in mind. So exposure, temperature, chemical, UV, all one thing. And now also aesthetics. So it might be that we don't care as much about the way it looks. Maybe it just needs to be a certain color, but not held to that. It just needs to look green or look blue. Or maybe we have very specific requirements for color. And so we need to hold that color consistently. Maybe a few different parts are a certain color and they get assembled. And so they need to match. So when you assemble them, they look nice to the eye. They're all matching, not much of a, a color change, delta E change between them. So what color does it need to be? Will I need to have a particular texture or feel to the material? So will I add texture to it so it feels a certain way? Or can I have it polished so maybe it ejects off the part nicely? Or polished to give a class A surface? What type of texture or feel do I need out of this? And then some materials, because of just the inherent nature of the material will have a particular color or look to it that can be difficult to overcome, as well as fillers and reinforcements, and sometimes additives, will cause it to give it a rougher surface or give it a certain appearance that you will then have to fight if you do not want it to look that way. And so a couple examples here. And then lastly, the note to be had is any type of regulatory approval. So maybe it's a UL for flame testing, Maybe it's a medical uh, USB class six type of regulatory. A lot of times you can lose your approval when you are coloring at the press. So that's something we also need to consider. So if you need maybe that V0 grade that we were talking about earlier needs to be a particular color, we would need to get it in that color from the supplier or we would need to get that material and then have an additive for coloring it or color, excuse me, provided that can be used in that particular material. So again, more things to have to consider when we're making selections of materials and then particular grades of those materials. So a couple examples, phenolic cured TPVs. So standard TPVs uh, are made with phenolic as the catalyst. You end up with little black specks, which is what's shown right there. It's inherent in the way that it's made. So you're gonna get black specks. If that's unacceptable, then maybe we look at something else. We potentially look at a different cured TPV or we look at a different type of soft material that could do what you're looking for it to do. Coloring PPS, uh, so the material has quite a, a tannish beige-ish color to begin with. And so getting to color it and making it certain colors can be difficult. If you came and told me you'd like a fuchsia pink in PPS, I would say that's not going to happen. 
but we could get it so it kind of looks pink. And if that's acceptable, awesome. If not, then maybe we're not using that material or we're trying to figure something out that will work in its place. And then the final one, the picture down below, is a Molly lubricated nylon. So maybe we're using it because we need the good wear properties that it gives, but that's what it looks like naturally. So if you say, hey, I want this in yellow, that's not gonna happen either. So you get gray and then normally black. So those are generally your options for that. So a lot of these different materials with reinforcements or just the material itself has a certain appearance. And so if you have expectations of it meeting something, we might not be able to do it. And then the other thing to keep in mind is we do sometimes have where you'll be assembling with a different base material. And so we have to fight that. And or if it's a different, not even plastic, if you're comparing it to something that's been painted or coated, trying to match that can also sometimes be difficult. Some additional examples would be if you have a heat stabilized material, which would be your top left, you can kind of see it's got a little, looks more of a tannish, but really what happens is standard copper heat stabilizers give you a little bit of a green hue to the material. So if you have a, a particular color, you want to color it after the fact. So maybe you color it at the press, you blend in the color. Because it already has a little bit of that green hue, you're going to fight that every time. And so it can be difficult versus the same impact modified 6.6 without the heat stabilizer. So a little bit of a color shift there. And then I have a picture of an unfilled and a glass filled 6.6. So 30 glass versus the unfilled. You can see the 30 glass has and it looks like the verbiage is a little switched, but the glass on the left, you can see kind of roughs up the surface versus a really nice shiny polished surface of an unfilled. So if you come and you say, hey, I love the appearance of the unfilled, but I need the glass to achieve the stiffness and strength I'm looking for, and the expectation is that it's going to look the same, that's simply not gonna happen. We added the glass, it's going to change the appearance. Now we might be able to get closer to what you're expecting, but the glass will rough up the surface. And so you will see a difference. Uh, up in the top right, you'll see a haze difference, kind of seeing the guy's fingers be behind it. So you have kind of what we consider a little bit more of a crystal clear material in the SMMA. So 0.3% haze, that'd be similar to maybe like a polycarbonate, very clear compared to what would be around a standard 8% haze in a random clarified propylene. So propylene, you can get clear, but it's not what we would consider crystal clear. So we need to have that expectation that that's what we're working with. And then something like an unfilled PEI, so Altem type material, you're gonna have kind of that amberish color. And so if you're wanting something, again, very crystal clear, no tint, no coloring to it, simply not gonna happen. The chemistry of it is what gives it that appearance. Same with soul phones, they have kind of an amberish, yellowish appearance that you would be fighting the entire time. And so we just have to set expectations that certain materials look a certain way. And so we're gonna do our best to meet and get what you need out of it, but just know that there will be some limitations. Okay, so appearance, exposure. Now some additional uh, potential requirements could be if it needs anything for regulatory approval or compliances for testing or data. So stuff like NSF, if you need NSF 14 for know piping for you know pipe grades or pipe fittings if you need 51 for food contact uh, so if it's going to be you know maybe in a, a coffee pot or something or it's going to be a little tray to hold the food in a restaurant potentially needs nsf 51 and then nsf 61 for potable water so if it's maybe a tube or a pipe or component that is going to see any type of water that we might end up drinking it needs to have nsf 61. And so again, we could pick the perfect material for you and then come to find out it needs to meet these additional regulatory requirements. Well, now we have to find a material. Hopefully it's still the one that maybe we suggested, but it might end up being that we need to pick a different grade because we need it to meet those requirements. Underwriters Laboratory UL, so if it needs flame rating, if it needs F1 for outdoor exposure, if it needs certain electrical testing, maybe, um, HWI, CTI, what have you, a bunch of different requirements potentially through there, but you will need that. You'll be, you'll require that for the application. We'd have to find a material that would do that. Maybe you need medical. So USP class six is the most common. So an approval for the material gets tested to show that it's uh, biocompatible. It's inert within our body. And so it could be used for medical devices. 
Uh, and then on the flip side, compliance sees where it's the material itself is not tested necessarily um, because the part ends up needing to be tested, but suppliers can provide data to give you confidence that it would pass it if you get the actual part itself tested. So stuff like FMVSS 302, which is a flame test. Uh, so the result is that the part is supposed to be tested, but data can be provided to show that it would pass that, that testing. Uh, ISO 10993, again for medical. So that's the testing that is mapped out for medical devices. And so we could provide data potentially for different to show the material that it, the material itself would pass it. But once assembled with other materials and going through maybe sterilization or what have you, it will need to have the final part tested. And then FDA, FDA doesn't approve materials, they will approve parts. And so we would have FDA compliant materials, just stating that you know we don't use certain ingredients, they don't migrate a certain way, uh, but we would have options for that. And then REACH, Rojas, Prop 65, if you're selling to California, um, some other things that we would potentially have on our material, either if you have to label it or not, but we would have those available for our materials. Okay. An example, this would be a section of a, a yellow card for flame testing. So in this particular one, it's for the Eco 525K from Ascend. It's a nylon 6.6 uh, with 25% glass. It meets 5VA and V0 testing. And you can see that it's only available, this particular line card, uh, excuse me, yellow card, is only available for black. And so this is for the F1 version of it. They have a non-F1 version that has an all color listing. So in cases where maybe they need to make it orange for the high voltage orange, uh, could potentially do that. But in this case, this one would be available in black. So if you said you need the F1 eco version in a different color, you're going to get it in black because that's how they provide it. And that's what the yellow card is meant for. So this would be an example of one. It's not the full yellow card. It just has flammability listed. There's additional testing underneath that I didn't put in here, but just to give a, a quick example of what that would look like. Okay. So exposure, regulatory, UL. NSF, all of that. And then even more to think about would be the part design itself. So you might pick a material, you might pick polycarbonate, for instance, which we do have on here and I'll get into, but maybe you pick polycarbonate because you need the great impact and it would work awesome. But then you design the part too thick and now you actually start to lose some of its impact performance because you made it too thick. And so on paper and what you've seen, and what we know of PC to be excellent impact material, but if it gets designed into a part with a sharp corner or it is designed too thick, now it's not going to perform the way that we'd expect it to, and it would end, it ends up being a lot more because it's in the very notch sensitive, a lot less impact performance. And so these all play into how the materials can perform when we go to put it in application. This particular screen kind of shows us the flow performance of a nylon versus a PC. Uh, we know that PC does not shear thin as readily. It's a little, pushes a little harder. So at the same thickness, which I put a red line through at 1.5 millimeter, you can see you get about 225 to 325 millimeter of flow out of a nylon versus a polycarbonate that only gives you 75 to 175. So maybe if I had originally started planning on using a nylon 6.6 six, six or what have you, and then I decide that my application actually, because of what I'm doing with it or what I need out of it, maybe it needs to be clear, maybe I need better impact, whatever the reason, if I switch to a polycarbonate as the material I'm gonna end up using, I need to recognize that it's not gonna flow as well. So there's the potential I need an additional gate or I need to work on the thickness to get to flow a little bit easier. There, they would be things within the part design itself I might need to address if I'm going to use one material versus another. Okay. So the other, so the things in those cases, we'd be looking at, you know, the thickness of the part. So is it within a standard thickness? Is it kind of thin? Do I need a material that's going to flow really well if it's thin? Or is it standard or maybe even a little bit thicker? So is that going to be an issue? I need to know what my flow length is. So if it's not going to flow very well or flow the distance I need it to, again, maybe I'm doing the additional gate. And then how and where am I going to gate it? So gating thick to thin, or maybe I need a couple gates, or maybe I need a different type of gate. And so all things to be considered when we're looking to select a material and then design for said material. 
certain materials require different thicknesses for the gates and the openings. And so again, all these things should be required, or excuse me, um, should be discussed and determined when we go to select a material and then do all the designing for it. Ideally, it's being done beforehand and at the initial start of the, the uh, application. Sometimes it's at the end and the material has already been picked and designed for, and then we find out it doesn't really work the way that we need it to. That's why hopefully we're looking at all of these requirements up front and then picking the right material for it based on what's needed. Okay. And some additional things that we might want to consider, what type of conversion process. So most of these and what we're referencing is going to be injection molded parts, but maybe it's extrusion, maybe it will be blow molded. And so different sets of requirements might be needed depending on how you're going to do it. What type of processing temperatures are needed for this resin? Do I have the ability to get it hot enough to run it? Do I have the ability to get my mold hot enough so it cools correctly? Some materials that are, are really high temperature, specifically semi-crystalline materials, are going to need oil to keep the mold at a hot enough temperature to meet the recommended mold temperatures that are required for that particular resin. And so if you are sending it to or are a molder that has not done these high temperature materials in the past and all of a sudden you're being asked to do it are you set up to do it do you have the oil ability the ability to use oil to heat a mold and so all these questions that would need to be addressed we would hopefully not be suggesting a material that would need that uh, for a molder that cannot do it or doesn't do it but in some cases maybe the environment dictates that I need the higher temperature material to withstand it. And so it will be required. How difficult will it be to degate or demold the resin? How will the cost play into our resin selection? Am I limited to a certain cost because a piece price needs to be a certain cost? Or is it going to be, hey, I just need it under this. And then it gives us a little bit better of a selection. But always, if we're addressing all of these, we will hopefully not be over engineering and then not selecting material that is going to be too costly for the application. And then lastly, as we mentioned before, again, are we matching shrinkage for an existing tool? Because that narrows about half of our options down. And if we have to match exactly what we're using. And then again, for the common processing guide, if you have it open, you'll see it mold temperatures and melt temperatures. So in the section for your mold temperature, if you're seeing anything over the 212, uh, you're going to start to have to use oil and so if we're suggesting a high temperature material that needs that again are you set up or is the molder set up to do something like that everything that we need to consider so a lot of different things from processing designing exposure expected performance that we all need to consider every time we're going to make a material suggestion and so whether it's we've got historical information on it and we can run through it quickly and make a suggestion and know that certain materials don't work for applications or if we need to slowly kind of work through every single one and figure out, you know, start eliminating, finding the material that works best. These are the process and questions that need to be addressed. So we make sure that we're selecting the right material for any given application. And then the other thing to note is that myself and other techs, specifically here at Chase, you know, we're not the expert in your part. We, we like to think we're fairly good at knowing materials and their performance. We're not an expert at your part though. And so we kind of work hand in hand to figure out what's required, what you know works and doesn't work to figure out what's gonna be the best option. So that's kind of the way to work through selecting a material for a given application. Okay, well, that is what I had for you guys. Awesome, thank you, Andrea. Um, again, for your comprehensive presentation, Andrea was uh, demonstrating, I think it was the page before this, Andrea, she has the um, the chart up there. You guys can find that chart. It's called the Common Processing Guide as an attachment um, on here as well, in addition to some other attachments that you may find useful, uh, including Andrea's presentation. Um, so at this time, if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box. It's the box on the upper right hand that has the question mark in there. You can click on that tab and type in a question. Or you can raise your hand and I will unmute your microphone if you would rather um, 
just speak your question out loud. We have Jason Merkel, technical manager who has been with Chase Plastics since 2012 on hand to assist Andrea with questions today. Um, as a reminder, as you type your questions, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. Your responses have and will help shape the future of Chase and Knowledge webinars and we welcome your feedback. Also, be sure to check out our blog page at the chaseplastics.com backslash blogs and past webinar recordings and future webinar announcements and registration at chaseplastics.com backslash webinars. You can now register for our next Chase and Knowledge webinar, which will be held on August 27th on outdoor plastics. You can either go to the webinars page of our website or just click on the registration link that I pasted in the chat box here today. That will take you directly to that registration page. Um, and if you'd like to have a custom Chase and Knowledge topic presented at your organization, please reach out to Andrea or myself and we'll be happy to get that set up for you. Uh, so we will hand this over to Jason now for some questions. Jason, if you want to go through the questions that are popping up. Yep, no problem. Thanks, Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea, first question relating to UV stability. Um, knowing that ABS may not be the, the greatest with UV to start, um, how about if we use a UV package for ABS, can we improve the weatherability this way? you can it will improve it um, it's still not going to be what we would consider the best performance for uv you will get a little bit better in terms of it won't color shift as quickly uh, but it is still going to color shift quite a bit i would say a good rule is if it's going to be outside we we would not at any point in time suggest abs if it's going to be inside and it's going to see some filtered light potentially an abs with so uv stabilizer. It'll help some, but ABS is so readily attacked by UV rays. It's just not very recommended. Um, they do have the option at that point would be to move something to something like an ASA, uh, which simply uses a kind of a different rubber versus your butadiene in ABS. So still styrenic, uh, similar-ish performance to ABS, but it will have the good UV performance that is needed. Awesome. Thanks, Andrea. Um, relating to the yellow card that you showed, um, next question was, why does the yellow card have two flame values, uh, 5V and V0, for the same listed thickness? Sure. So 5VA or 5VB and the V for vertical testing are done on different test specimens. And so a given thickness could perform 5VA and V0 at the same thickness. So depending on what you need, if it's a requirement for whatever application it is, uh, it might be that a 5VA rating is needed or a V0 rating is needed, again, depending on the performance and what UL is dictating for that particular application, what it needs to be. But it's a different test uh, and a different specimen sample. And so they're both tested then at that thickness. And in this case, both pass at 1.5 millimeter for this particular material, as well as at three millimeter. Yeah, to further clarify, I mean, really from an HB rating all the way up to 5VA, it's three separate tests, uh, different configurations, different sample sizes in some cases, and some of the primary differences going from V0 to 5VA or 5VB testing, any 5V testing really, is the intensity of the flame is also increased and the um, uh, criteria to pass basically changes as well. So um, theoretically, you could have the same material tested to all three different tests and have all three radians of the same thickness as a result. So thank you, Andrea. Um, one customer encountered a difference in the flame rating of a HB for per U on 94 on a print, and then the spec sheet states SE. Can you explain the difference? Uh, sure. So SE probably came from if they were going to, that's commonly done if it's given for um, like a 302 testing. So the flame testing for FMBS 302, but SE would be self-extinguishing. So it goes out. And so each of the flame testing has different requirements. HB being that it at different thicknesses will determine the burn rate. 
And so there, it's allowed a certain kind of millimeter per minute burn rate. And if it's SE, it means it goes out. It doesn't hit any of that. It doesn't need to be recorded because it simply goes out once you remove the flame. So depending on what you're looking at and where the SC is coming from, a lot of times you see it more in um, your automotive FMVSS 302, ISO 3795, maybe the Hyundai MS, gosh, the 308, I think is the value. Um, that's typically where you'll see SC listed. For HB rating on a UL yellow card, it will just give you that it's HB and then the thickness. It doesn't give you the data then that shows the burn rate uh, for the testing. Yeah, I, I would say that in addition that a UL, any, any material that is truly self-extinguishing will probably pass an HB rating for UL 94, but not every material that has an HB rating would be considered self-distinguishing for our end. It just means that it has a slow enough burn rate to pass the horizontal burn testing for, for HB. So many times that we're looking at UL ratings specifically, if we truly need uh, a self-extinguishing type of product, we're, we're most commonly looking to something that's vertically rated from V2 to V0 and, and up the value chain. Uh, I had a question about CP Prime, Andrea, about why we developed uh, the commodity and engineering resins. You want me to field that one? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a bit of an open ended answer, but you know we we developed our our private label portfolio uh, to work hand in hand with our customers to fill gaps where there may not be a pre existing material. Um, in addition to being able to control um, some of the markets where we sell product into. So for instance, if you need something really unique, a bright yellow 17% glass fiber filled nylon that meets an FDA rating, that might not be an off the shelf type of product from one of our suppliers. So we would work internally to create a formulation and work with a, a compounding partner to produce that to our specification. So it really just gives us a little more flexibility into what we're able to sell into the market. We certainly have a very long list of, of off the shelf type of items that we uh, that we use uh, day in and day out. But when we need to go outside of those, CP Prime gives us some flexibility to do so. And the nomenclature itself also exists when we take a branded product and we do anything to it. So if we blend in color for you, we can no longer call it 21 SPF. We have to give it a CP Prime nomenclature because we've changed what we did. So it also exists for that as well. Um, this next one, not so much of a question, but maybe a note for, for Sherry, um, a, a note that there was no registration link on the website for the next Chase the Knowledge and I uh, couldn't locate it in the chat. Could you reshare that in the chat, Sherry? Yep. Um, I'll actually, Sanjay, I'll, I'll attach that link here to your question. So um, it may just be that that registration link may not show up live until this one is over. Um, but I will share the, the link here as well in the question section. Do we include it in the email when we send out the recording? For sure. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we get out to everyone. We'll try to post it here as well. Um, the last question that appears for the time being, Andrea, um, do you have any advice for bonding uh, pelethane materials to stainless steel? Been recommended to try various priming and cleaning methods that have all proved ineffective so they resorted to etching steel and a secondary heat and pressure treatment by some bonding tpu to stainless sure so typically when we deal with overmolding, generally it's plastic on plastic but in some cases you are trying to bond it to something other than that so the simplified version of the mechanism in which it works is when you're doing plastic on plastic the TPU in this case, or a different TPE that's being used, will be warm enough, hot enough when you're processing it, that it creates a kind of, it melts down the surface of whatever it's bonding to. And then you have a fusion of the two surfaces. And that's what creates what they call kind of like your chemical bond uh, between them. Your TPU is never going to get hot enough to, I mean, it could, and that would be a problem. Uh, but your TPU is not going to get hot enough to, to melt down the steel to get the fusion of your two uh, uh, interfaces. 
to create a chemical bond like you can with other plastic materials. And so they give you treatments in, in kind of way to force it to mechanically bond. So create etching, um, little surfaces on it to grab onto and try to stick to. Uh, so the other way of doing it is mechanical interlock. So it kind of flows into something, locks around something to grab onto it. So treating it, um, plenty of different treating ones, the etching, anything to rough up the surface to allow more surface area for the TPU to try to grab onto is what they're suggesting. Most of the time, I believe when we've seen it, I haven't seen it too often, but generally some type of adhesive has to be used to allow it to stick because it doesn't, it's never going to melt down the metal. Yeah, I would say most of the time, if there's not a, an opportunity for mechanical um, adhesive, or for the you know the TPU to shrink onto the stainless, there's there's going to need to be some sort of alternative uh, material interface to help them bond to one another. Because to Andrea's point, they won't they won't naturally chemically bond. So um, typically, we've seen the same types of recommendations for priming and and cleaning, whether it be surface treatment of the TPU ahead of time. Um, I would think some sort of primer would also be uh, necessary in a lot of cases, but with the different types of TPU chemistries out there, it may have to be a little more pointed in terms of the, the primer chosen uh, rather than a one size fits all specific to the grade um, of pelothane that you're, you're referencing. So um, we'd be happy to take it um, offline and discuss a little further to get into the specifics of the grade you're using and see if there's anything else to recommend. But even we here at Chase, I mean, with our many options from materials to choose from, we typically default to the the primer producers because they tend to know their products best. But I'd uh, be happy to help point you in the right direction uh, after the call as well. Um, another question here, Andrea: Do we have a grade of ASA that would sub for Velox three sixty four in black? I would say probably. I don't know that great off the top of my head, so I'd have to look at it offline to figure that out specifically. But Velox, yeah, we, not like PBT, this is ASA. We'd have to check. I mean, really, the, the that Velox grade is a is a V zero PC PBT. So um, we'd want to look at all the CTQs of the application to figure out what what can give. I mean, no, going from PC PBT to ASA. In general, there's going to be some shifts in thermal performance. There's going to likely be a downgrade in chemical resistance that the PBT portion is adding to the Velox. And then arguably the biggest hump to overcome is the, the V0 rating. There's there's not that much flame retardant ASA on the market. Um, Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, but not something we've stumbled across a lot. But um, be happy to take uh, this off offline as well and see how we can dig into the application needs and figure out what would be best fit. And shrinkage probably too. We do have some FR PC ASA. I think they're all filled though. I don't know if that great Velox grade is filled or not, but uh, I don't think it's reinforced, but the filler might not hurt. The shrink rate for that Velox is eight to ten thou. So um so uh, we got pretty pretty low on, on shrink rate with the ASA. So might be some some issues there as well. All right, that looks uh, like all of our questions, right, Jason? Do we get to all yes. of them? Yes. Okay, well. great. Yep. Um, well, again, we would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this Chase and Knowledge webinar. Um, we hope it was informative and a great return on the investment of your time. If you have any technical questions that didn't get answered today, feel free to reach out to Andrea directly. Um, you will be receiving a couple of emails following the conclusion of this webinar, including a recording of the webinar um, and an email from Andrea uh, that will include her presentation as well as a link to that next webinar we have scheduled in August on outdoor plastics. Uh, thank you uh, all again for attending and we hope to see you at the next Chase the Knowledge webinar in August. Thank you.